we get bored in the salon because we're never trying anything new. If you stay educated, it gets you excited. It gets you wanting to try something new. You try that new thing on your guests, then all of a sudden you have a higher average ticket. What's up, guys? Welcome to today's podcast. This is the Woke Up This Way podcast, uh, brought to you by MinervaBeauty.com. Um, excited for today. Had a little bit of technical difficulties. It happens every time. I actually shouldn't even say. I should just let you guys know when we don't have technical difficulties. It'd probably be easier. But today, I have special guest, Andrew Does Hair. Really excited to have him on. Um, like I said, this podcast is brought to you by MinervaBeauty.com. If you're looking for salon furniture, uh, the best in the business, 10% off Uh I think everything, I'm not sure, but go to MinervaBeauty.com backslash FSE uh, to see the deals that they have for you. Um, but if you're looking for salon furniture, best place to go ever. Let me bring on Andrew Does Hair. Let's see, Andrew. Let's see if I can pull you up here. There you are. What's up? How's it going? <laughs> so it's been a long time since we've, uh, let me see if I can, there we go. I got your sound. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been on a podcast together. Yeah, too long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, way too long. But the cool thing is that a lot has happened to both of us uh, in that amount of time. So the first time I was saying it a couple podcasts ago that um, we, well, the first time we ended up on a podcast, it was really because of Gordon Miller and we didn't know each other. Yeah. So um, it's kind of nice to now know who you are. Like we both know who each other are. And uh, I think we have a lot more to talk about at this point, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I keep telling myself, don't talk about cameras. Don't talk about cameras. Don't talk about cameras because it's all I want to talk to you about. <laughs> I know. But that's the that's I the fun thing. And I think a lot more people want to know about that stuff. So I do want to talk a little bit about that. And I have some questions for you. Um, you have, and I'm actually going to showcase your uh, Instagram real quick. I, I pulled up your Instagram earlier, shot a little video of it, but... Um, there's a couple of things I noticed about it when I did that, because I haven't looked at it as a full page in a while, but beautiful work. You've, you've really, uh, focused a lot on advancing your photography skills. So I want to talk about that because I think that can help a lot of people. Um, but also I noticed that your page kind of went from a lot of pictures of your work to most recently, it seems like you're adding a lot more tips and video work and that kind of thing. So, uh, is that something that you're, more focused on or kind of where are you at right now with that? Okay, man, this is, I hope you don't mind long answers. Um, yeah, no. I realized, I started to realize about four years ago that people who like do well on Instagram and on social media, at some point they realize, and yourself are definitely included in this, uh, yeah. eventually you realize at some point that, hey, my job is to make content. And you know, we have so many people in the industry industry who go, well, I don't want to buy a nice camera. I'm just a hairdresser. And like a lot of people in the industry will even put down the content creators. But at some point you realize, hang on, if I want all the things that I hope Instagram can bring me, I need to make photography and videography my job or a, a huge part of my job. And so right. I realized that and uh, I started noticing that literally every like opportunity I've gotten didn't come from somebody walking into my salon and going, hey, you do good work. Do you want to be in this magazine? It came from somebody seeing my Instagram portfolio and offering me something because of the work that they had seen. And so it, it became very, very real and obvious that every single benefit we're going to get through social media it comes down to your photography skills, comes down to the way you present your work, um, or even down to how good you are in front of a camera. I mean, like you're very good at talking in front of a camera. I'm trying to get better at it. And that's actually why I started doing the recent videos is um, it's more or less just an exercise for me to become more like you and just be good on camera because I feel like that's something I'm lacking. Uh, Seth Godin is one of my favorite authors and he says, yeah, for sure. like he has so many blog posts and books about this similar topic where it's basically like, he says, if, you, if you're the second best in the world at what you do, um, I think he uses violin for the example, at some point, sitting and practicing the violin isn't going to make your career better, but getting out and getting a good recording of you playing violin or meeting the right managers or whatever, that's going to help you become the first best violinist. And so I think in hair, um, 
we look at the people who, I mean, everybody watching this can probably agree that there's somebody who's like big on Instagram, who's not as good as them. And we yeah. get mad about that and we feel like something's wrong or they cheated. But the truth of the situation is that um, like at some point, if you're good enough at hair, you need to start getting better at other things if you want yeah. to get the benefit that social media can bring, which is get better at your photos, get better at your videos, get better at teaching. You know, I meet so many people who want to be an, want to be an educator. I'm like, well, what are you doing toward that? And they go asking you. But but ultimately, like, sit down and try to teach a haircut. Um, one of the things you'll notice about my recent little tutorial videos is they're all under one minute. And that was a challenge I gave myself is I want to I want to take these big concepts. Here's how to do a whole graduated bob in 58 seconds. And uh, to me, like, if you can teach something in under a minute, you understand it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, like, but. I sat down in this studio here, this office, and I mapped out and I planned, like, how can I teach a bob in one minute? And I ruined a mannequin head trying it. And then I ruined another mannequin head trying it. And then on the third head, I finally got it down. And, uh, but it, it all stemmed from this very real realization that like, if you want to get sponsored, um, and, and I mean, no offense to any sponsor of this, I actually have Minerva, um, <laughs> equipment in here, but, uh, right. if someone wants to get sponsored, what a sponsorship really is at its core is like, hey, we need you to make us content and we'll give you stuff or money. And so yeah. when I meet barbers and hairstylists who are like, I want to get sponsored, I'm like, you realize what they want from you is just photos, right? If you want to win a competition, they want photos from you. If you want a shout out, they want good photos so they can repost it and get their views up. It all comes down to this thing, you know? Yeah. And so barbers and stylists go, well, my job is cutting hair. And if I get better at cutting hair, I'm going to get all these opportunities. No, you're not. If you get better at this, you get the opportunities. Yeah. So there's a long answer. No, that's I good. Hope it answered questions. Yeah, I like that. And um and that and it really goes down to like you were saying that people get frustrated uh, that other people aren't as like talented at haircutting, but they're more popular. But like I've never gotten frustrated that my talent, like when I look at another person, I'm like, they have more uh of not even that they get a, more of a following because I always look at the interaction that happens. And that's where like, I get jealous of people that are figuring out how to not only have a following, but also a really committed community, because that means that you're actually yeah. like, you've really brought something to people. So I always get jealous of the things that I see somebody doing. I don't look at them and go, Oh, you do. You're I'm better at haircutting than you. So I should be more famous than you. I've looked at them and I'm like, well, why are they more, popular or why do they get the, the more attraction on their posts? They get it because of what you're saying. They get it because they're better at the other things. And it's the same thing in the salon. Like in the salon, you have tons of hairdressers that are um, at different talent levels. But a lot of the time, like the one that's not even that good is the one that's the most busy in the salon. And it's because they're good with people. They're good, they're with, good with people. Uh, yeah. They're good with people. They're good. Yeah. Like I, I think another thing too, not just so this is the hard thing for me because I'm very technically minded. And so I'll, I'll, I'll look at the way that I lit myself here. And I look at the way that I composed my, my little background here. And like, I, I'm all technical, technical, technical. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the job is to translate an emotion. And with hair, I've been doing it long enough and I'm like proficient enough with haircuts. I'm not saying I'm great at haircuts, but I, but I can take a haircut and make somebody feel some kind of way with it. And that's yeah. what my business was built off of is how the clients feel. And uh, through photography, I've been able to, kind of get viewers to feel something as well, whether they're pissed off that I did a haircut that's not as good as them or, uh, or whether they're like, wow, that's inspiring, you know? But at the end of the day, it's all about, like, it sounds cliche, but it's all about the way people feel, whether yeah. it's a photo of a haircut, a video about a haircut. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll look at, every now and then I'll see a video on Instagram that like technically is perfect. Like, I'm like, that is so informative and it's shot beautifully and the numbers just aren't there. Uh, but yeah. But then other times I'll see videos where it's just a guy blowing vape smoke on a on a client's <laughs> head and dancing and stuff. And right. like and I'm like, there's nothing here, but they have six million views. Like, what the heck? And so I my gut reaction is to be frustrated by that and be like, oh, the system's wrong, the system's cheated. But then I realize my haters think the exact same thing about me. And so it's just like we look at things we don't understand and we immediately think it's wrong or whatever. But ultimately what I'm learning as an adult now and like trying to figure out and be better at is to look at somebody who's doing better than me, doing something that makes me cringe and go, why do other people like that? Like, and not even necessarily so I can copy it, but yeah. just so I can add it to the Rolodex. Like, um, 
I think in hair, it's really easy to copy what's popular and what works. I think it's also really easy to deliberately do the opposite of what's popular and what works, but it's really, really hard to understand what's popular, why it's popular and say, I get that. I get that. But also I like this other thing and I'm going to do it my way. And yeah. uh, that's what I kind of aim to do is like, see what works and see what's popular and understand it and maybe take pieces from it um, as they fit my style, but ultimately do what I want to do. I would say too, like when you look at, I'm going to throw your Instagram up here again, but when you look at your images, they're not typical, but they're just enough. Like they're just enough mainstream to where somebody could twist it and wear it. Like I think, and like you're saying, you provoke emotion with it. And that's, I, you definitely do that the best out of anybody. I think when I look at somebody's Instagram and you also have branded yourself in a point where like, if I see an image and I just know it's yours, like I can tell because of those little details that you put into it. So I love that. And I want to, I want to kind of jump into this question that you asked on my Instagram because I actually think you have an answer and, um, or a thought. And I did talk about it on the podcast that, you know, you did ask the question about, but I just thought it was a cool and I like the way that you provoke conversation. So why don't we talk about this? And you said, you know, what happened before you decided to start making your content? A lot of people, myself included, tend to wait until they feel worthy, um, before they educate. So, Let's, I want to hear from you about that because I think there are a lot of people out there and, and we kind of, I think you could get that answer from what you just said a little bit ago. But um, if we go a little bit deeper into that, what do you think is like, because you've, you haven't necessarily been educating for, for a long time on Instagram. You've, you've started that more recent, but um, through your conversation, through your images, I think you do, you know, you do teach and you're obviously worthy. So what is that in your in your mind, what do you think was happening? Why are you asking that kind of question? Um, and what, what is making you do it now, I guess? Well, so what brings it up is I, I see a common thing all over Instagram, uh, particularly in the men's hair world, where people will bash an educator for being a self-proclaimed educator. And like, who do you think you are? Like, you think you're better than us to go up there and teach. And uh, I think what this kind of stems from there was a time in the hair industry and you remember this because we've both been doing this forever, where if you yeah. wanted to be on stage, you wanted to like be somebody, you had to do it through a company. A company would pay to put you on stage. And right. uh, and so they chose you that you're good enough. You can teach for us. You, you know our ways. You can sell our products. And uh, something happened since social media is now people can put themselves in that position and then the companies run after them instead of the companies putting them up there. And so now the companies go, oh, you're popular. Can we hire you? And so since that shift, I think there's a lot of people kind of stuck in the old mindset, like, wait, Redkin didn't ordain you or Paul Mitchell didn't like, like give you this title. Who do you think you are being an independent educator? And, uh, but I, I think now with social media, I mean, you can be a hairdresser in the middle of nowhere. And if you put out good content, you can be an educator. And so I think a lot of people don't realize that when yourself and when myself, when we picked up a camera and we started doing this, Nobody gave us permission. Nobody walked in and said, hey, you should do this. Like, you know, right. I didn't get a letter from from Tony and Guy and I never trained with Tony and Guy. I'm not affiliated with them, but I didn't get a letter from like a big company saying, hey, we think you're really good. You should make content like I just started doing it. And right. the way that I thought about it in the beginning, and I still think of it this way is like, look, I don't think I have all the answers for all the hair, hairdress and, hairdressers and barbers but I have the answers that have worked for me and I'm going to put them out there. And if people want them, here they are. And if people don't want them. Cool. Scroll on. Um, but, but then I see so many people who I want to be an educator. What do I have to do first? I'm like, you find someone, and I'm going to steal this from Maddie Conrad. You find somebody who doesn't know what you know, you show them what you know, and there you are, you're an educator. And uh, so I don't know. I, in my opinion, I think every person who thinks they uh, on any level want to educate, do it. Like yeah. get your, get your salon neighbors to show up on a Sunday afternoon and say, Hey, I, I know this technique. I want to show you guys. And honestly, that's how I kind of started is I would go to like um, cosmetology schools, in my area and do free classes just so I could get figure out if I even knew how to teach. And uh, eventually that turned into small salon classes. And, and, you know, at one point it built up to a crowd of 400 in a bar somewhere. It was pretty cool. But uh, like you, you start 
just doing it. And no, nobody has yeah. to walk in and say, hey, we think you're good enough to educate. You just freaking do it. And there'll be naysayers and haters who are like, oh, well, who ordained you for this? But like, nobody has to anymore. Um, yeah. Like the whole YouTube culture, which I'm only just now starting to like dive into, is people who just picked up a camera and started talking. And yeah. uh, that's all we have to do now. Yeah, that's, for sure. So that's my thoughts on it. I think that's awesome. And and the way that I look at education, because I, I did kind of grow up in the Paul Mitchell. I worked for Paul Mitchell for 10 years, but that's what I think, like, that's the stuff I taught, you know, like, and I was trained that way, but it's not, that way was like, I, I'm very grateful for my Paul Mitchell education because I feel like back then, and I don't know what it's like now because I don't go through trainings or anything, but um, back then they taught us how to speak. They taught us, you know, it wasn't just about, cutting hair. It was about like, um, you know, how to do intros, how to do outros, how to, you know, what, how to sell, like how they taught us everything. Um, so when I started creating content, it was like, I just taught on camera the way I taught in a class, um, and the things that I knew from then, and then it grew from there. And what I think a lot of people need to understand is that like, and, and you're doing it like, teach what you're passionate about. Don't teach, like, don't just teach everything. Like when people, people read right through you. If you're trying to do something that you're not passionate about, like this podcast is not popular compared to anything else that I do. Like I put out, um, how to blow dry your bangs two days ago, got a hundred thousand views in a, in a day. This podcast will get 2000, you know, like it's just, but this is my passion. I love doing this. I love having these conversations. I don't care. Like I don't do any of this stuff for that. Um, so like for me, it's, it's all about just sharing something that you're passionate about. People pick up on that. And when you are passionate about something, um, that's when the people will start to like, you know, follow you and not to follow you, but like you build a community, like all these questions, like being able to throw these questions up and have people ask stuff and, and just create conversation is one of the greatest things about the internet that we have now Yeah, being able to like, we used to, I used to like pray to be able to get put on a platform and travel the country and do all that stuff. Now I pray that I don't ever have to do that again. Like I love sitting in this room and walking behind that wall and creating hair tutorial videos and educating that way. And I, if I don't have to step foot in a hair show ever again, and I get to do that and then go home to my family every night and just hang out with my kid and, and my wife and just, you know, enjoy life. Like that's, that's the beauty of what this industry is about now. And, um, you know, and that's what people need to understand. I share what I'm passionate about. I was passionate about haircutting and I was passionate about scissors and I was passionate about podcasts. And like, that's what I started doing. And the reason that a lot of these people, they'll put out a video and it'll be a beautiful video and like cutting the perfect Bob and it'll showcase and it won't get the views. And then I look at, well, how consistently are they even posting? Because they spent three months trying to make that video and they put it out and then they wait three more months and they put out a video. Right. So like, that's why you don't get the views. It doesn't happen from one video. And when you look at Andrew and I learned something from you where, um, I'll fully delete my Instagram posts. Like I go back and I delete because I want to refresh and I want to rebrand and I want to take some of those old videos and make new videos out of them. Like repurposing content that you've made over the years is one of the best things that, that happened because now I can produce content pretty much daily from old stuff, like to repurpose. So like, you know, that's, what's cool. And I see you posting videos nonstop and it's actually firing me up, you know, like, I see you doing it. And I'm like, I got to, I got to get back to that. Why am I not making videos enough? Like, it's just fun. You know, You know what's funny? Is I, I started doing those videos because of you. And so I guess we have like a feedback loop here. Like <laughs> I, I, about a month or two ago, I realized I had been really stagnant with my content and uh, I just bought a couple new cameras and I'm all excited about them. And I wanted to start doing YouTube just talks. And actually I'm, my YouTube channel is really leaning toward like camera gear. I don't even barely talk about hair on there, but anyways, yeah. uh, I was looking at your page and I was like, dude, this, this guy puts out a video every day. Like I, why am I not doing that? I have a studio here. I have a closet full of mannequin heads. Why am I not doing a video every day? And the answer is like, I got a wife and a kid and I have other duties and responsibilities, but like, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I came in here and like every chance I got, I would just sit down and make a video. 
And I still want to continue that. Like those little videos I've been putting out, I have a list of like 60 ideas. And uh, I, whenever I have spare time, I just come in here and bang one out. Yeah. And that's the key. Like you, like I'll get a question from somebody on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, and I'll save that into a folder and then I'll, or I'll write it down in notes and then I just keep track. And like, it's the littlest things. And I'm trying to go back to that because I got so you get tied up in sponsorship, right? So like, and that's the truth. So I I get tied up and I, and I'm supposed to create content and I'm never told what to create but I'm given products to create with, right? So it'll be like, and a lot of it was hair color products because hair color is where companies make money, right? And they don't make money off of a haircut. So haircut kind of draws people in, but you got to have color. That's where money is. So, and hairdressers love color techniques, but, um, so I got into the, the thing of like, Oh, I got to do a full color and a cut and like do this. And it's just harder when you, have to get into that mental mindset of doing something that you're not as passionate about. Right. So I'm yeah. good at color. I'm not bad at it. I'm, I've taught it for 10 years. Like I, I know it really well, but it's not my passion. Right. So, um, when, when you start doing that stuff, it becomes more of a job. And then when it becomes more of a job, it's harder to get yourself in that. So I went back and this week I made, you know, the blow drying to create volume in your bangs, like getting simple. Um, because we overcomplicate what content is, right? And you do this yeah. great. So you take a little piece of something, literally, and and I used to do this back in the day, but like you take the little detail of just scissor over comb for two inches, like just to give a tip about it. You don't have to do a whole head of it. Like you're just giving a little bit of knowledge to somebody, right? It's easier to consume. Well, people, people probably soak up so much. And I think especially on Instagram, our attention spans are so short. Like, I yeah. actively decided to stop using IGTV because people aren't on Inst- Like I realized that when I'm scrolling, if I see an IGTV video come up, I'll watch the first 59 seconds. And then when it asks me to like push the button, I'm like, nah, keep going. Yeah. Um, I, can, I would love to like steal the conversation and build off of what you're saying here. Yeah. Um, how you were talking about how you found yourself doing work that you weren't passionate about. And, you know, it was hard to get yourself to go to work. I had to, a few years ago, probably like two years ago, I sat down and I, I, I had a little talk with Andrew and I was like, Andrew, self, <laughs> what is success? To you? Like what? Like, because I, I just had so many opportunities in so many different directions. and I didn't know who I was or where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do. And I had to define success for myself, which was really helpful because it helped me define it for my potential students. Um, and the way that I define success for myself in hair is to never have to do a haircut I don't want to do. Like, and, and I would go even beyond that to never, I, like to me, success is never having to do a haircut you're not excited to do. And so right. for the last two years, I have not been unexcited to do a haircut. Like um, just because I position myself in a way, my price point, my location and whatever that every haircut I do, I'm excited to do. And uh, I heard a saying a, a few times, a few places, I don't know where it started, but they say that the reward for a job well done is the opportunity to do more work. And so as I've looked into YouTube, and, and different, even with Instagram, like I know if I post a video like this, um, whatever like this is, but yeah. if I post a video in a way that it's going to get more views and I'm deliberately trying to do that and it does well, what does that get me? The opportunity to do more of those videos. That's what they're going to want from me. And so yeah. ultimately I stopped taking opportunities that didn't just, that weren't fun. If something's not fun, I'm not going to do it. If something's fun, I'll do it for free. I'll lose money to do it. And, uh, and I only do stuff that I'm excited to do like I, you can try to pay me two grand to go do a class somewhere. I don't want to teaching about if somebody says, Hey, well, I'll give you two grand, three grand to come teach us how to do fades. Now nah, I'm cool. If somebody yeah. says, come teach us photography, we won't pay you. I'll, I'm actually getting on a plane this weekend to go do that. And right. uh, so <laughs> like I realized for myself that only doing work I'm excited to do is the goal. Money's not the goal. Following's not the goal. I stopped trying to grow my following, so to speak. I stopped putting out content that I, that was geared toward getting new people in. And I just started doing whatever felt fun that moment. I mean, there was a, a thing I used to say when I was younger and kind of more, I guess, like a lazy punk and everything. But I used to like, I used to look forward to the time in the day where I didn't have to do anything and I could do whatever struck me at that moment. And I'm trying to get back to that. Like I only want to do what strikes me in the moment. And so I have days where I'll come in here 
with no real plan. I have a list of ideas. And yeah. so it's funny, my friends ask, like, what is your job now? And I'm like, I go to the office and I do stuff. And they go, what stuff? And I'm like, some days it's cutting a mannequin head for a video. Some days it's inviting a model in for a photo shoot. Some days it's watching YouTube videos so I can learn. And uh, like, so I, I think that's when, when so many people talk about, like, I want to be an educator. I want to be sponsored. I want to have a bigger following. I'm like, okay, but what is the end goal? And they're like, what do you mean? Yeah. Sponsorship, bigger following. And I'm like, well, what will you be doing with your time at that point? Like, if, if I can make a hundred grand a year on YouTube talking to the camera, do I just want to talk to a camera? Like, I mean, it's fun to do with, with a good friend or, or somebody interesting to talk to, but, but I don't want my job to be sitting and talking to a camera. So like if I ended up doing really well, doing something that I just kind of am doing to get the numbers up that, and that becomes my job. Like that becomes the thing I fall into. I mean, literal story here. Like when I started ADH, I never thought it was going to be like a brand. I never thought it was going to be carried anywhere. Uh, today we have like 250 salons and barbershops in the U.S. that carry it. But it happened so gradually and I'm so grateful for it all happening because that's my bread and butter now. But uh, I never thought, hey, I'm going to be I'm going to sit in an office and, you know, deal with orders for for uh, a product line. But now that's kind. I do that more than I cut hair. And right. uh Going back in time, like if I had a crystal ball, like, hey, Andrew, do you want to sit in an office and take and manage a product line? Um, and <laughs> I, I don't do everything myself. We have a girl that ships and we have a guy, um, David, who runs the website and accounts and everything. But point being, like my job now essentially is to make content to sell product. That's right. what I do for a living. And uh, which is hilarious. So, Wait. So because your slogan is good hair doesn't come from a jar. So you have to. So. And this is like the best part because you're selling, you're going about selling product without selling product, right? Yeah. I mean, essentially. Which is, so it actually easy. says right on the jar. Yeah. Um, the biggest font on there. Oh, here, so, let me. Whatever. There you, here you uh, go. You're coming. Whatever. I'll just tell you. The, the, the biggest font on the jar says good hair doesn't come from a jar. And that all started um, years ago on Instagram. I would just post like thoughts. Um, kind of like micro blogs. And I just posted the words, good hair doesn't come from a jar and a little thought about like, it's all about the haircut. It's about the blow dry. It's about understanding your texture. It's about, you know, all the other things that is not product. And the reason I wrote it was in, in response to sort of like the men's hair culture at the time was very much buy this product and look this way. And, uh, and I was like, right. so frustrated by that. So I said, good hair doesn't come from a jar. And that one post ended up getting like way more likes than I had ever gotten. And it just took off. And so literally a week later, I trademarked it. And uh, it, it's it's kind of like lost its potency now because I feel like so many people are blow drying and are understanding hair cutting to a better level, which is amazing because that's that's what my dream was when I started saying all this. Yeah. But uh, men's hair at the time was very much like do a perfect fade, put the right product in it, and that's it. And now, now men's hairdressers and barbers very much are like texturizing hair and blow drying hair and and considering the shape of the haircut and all this. Um, but yeah, that's, so that's the whole good hair doesn't come from a jar thing. It was kind of like intended to be a blunt, sobering, honest statement to the consumer as well. In fact, um, I was really irritated with every product you pick up. It says in small letters on the jar, apply a dime size amount to damp or dry hair and style and then push into desired style. I'm like, why is that even on there? Like, yeah, for one, that's not helping anybody do their hair. And for two, that's it's like misleading as to what would create good hair, right? Like, oh, put this product in, comb it this way, you're good to go. And so the little instructions on my jar, they actually read, the right barber or hairstylist can tell you more about your hair than a jar ever could. And so the whole intention behind the, the brand is to put the emphasis back on the expertise of the barber or stylist who's actually doing your hair. And a lot of it um, kind of evolved during a time when I had kind of a beef with online hair tutorials because the yeah. guy on youtube is teaching Here, here's how i make my hair look cool buy this product use this promo code and you can be like me but it doesn't work that way because my hair is not your hair and uh, you know so youtube anybody online is recommending a product based on the model in their chair or based on their own hair but your barber or your hairstylist is recommending a product based on your hair and so i i very much wanted to try to it's kind of a like a 90s mentality like don't buy diverted product uh, but to me, like online sales were basically diverted product. And I wanted I wanted people to trust their barber for more than just getting a haircut. But for yeah. how do I get this calic to lay down? What product will volumize my hair? And I feel 
the professional who's providing all of that is offering a hell of a lot more value than the professional who's just doing a good haircut. Right. For Sorry sure. for the rant. <laughs> no, this is funny, <laughs> actually. So this is one of the questions I pulled for you. Um, he, I think it's a guy. He said, uh, as a barber, I feel I need to incorporate more hairstyling into the fades I give the majority of my clients. Where should I start? I never focused on that before. Do you agree with that? Is that, is that kind Absolutely. of what you're saying or what's your thought? So everything with me is a long story. When yeah. I started to become very, very busy in the salon, this was like long before Instagram. Uh, the way that I did it was blow drying every head and not just blow drying it dry, but styling it. I would flat wrap every head and I would polish every head. And so you imagine if you have a graduated Bob come in, you're not going to like rough dry it and be like, all right, get on your way. You're going to sit there and you're going to polish every piece. And so I was doing that with every haircut, long or short, man or woman or any anybody anywhere in between. Like everything I did was polished um, as far as the styling goes. But the haircuts to this day are just, you know, they're just normal haircuts. And uh, I learned, actually, I'll tell you a true story. I, I learned how to do fades later. And so as I was learning to do fades, I had this client, Nate, who had really dense, dark hair, but very pale skin. And so his hair faded like really, really beautifully. And one time when I cut his hair, I happened to have a cancellation after him. So I ended up taking um, twice as long to cut his hair. And I really, really focused on that fade. And when I was done, I blow dried his curly hair, super, super straight. And he left so polished and he was stoked. So the next time he came in, I didn't have a gap after him and I only had the normal time to cut his hair. And so rather, so now I knew I had half as long as I had the last time I cut his hair when he was thrilled. So I need to either not style it as well or not cut it as well. And I made the executive decision without talking to him. I decided, you know what? I'm really excited about fades since they're new to me and I'm good at them. And last time he was thrilled, this is fade. So I spent the entire time with him just fine tuning his fade so perfect. And I gave him the, like the best fade of my life. But when I was done, I put like a heavy gel in his damp hair and I took his curly hair and kind of like laid it back quickly. And so it was kind of wavy and, and laying back. So he leaves, he buys product on his way out. I think everything's great. Yeah. The next day I got a message from him on Instagram saying he was really disappointed. And I was like, oh my God, was the haircut not good? And he goes, no, the haircut's good. But I was in there before going on a date and you half-assed my style and I had to buy product and go home and style my hair before going out. And the guy never came back. And when actually, when he said that, I was like, dude, I'm so sorry. Next time you come in, haircuts on me. Like, I'm yeah. so sorry. And he was so mad that I didn't fully, thoroughly style his hair. And he was like going on a date afterward and had to go buy. He had a, the reason he bought product from me was not because I did a great a job, job, but because yeah. I didn't do my job. He had to go to his buddy's house because he didn't live in the area. He had to go find somewhere to style his own hair. Um, so that whole long story here. We get so micro focused as professionals on the technical aspect of what we do. And we go, wow, this fade is better than the last fade. But our clients don't look at it that way. Our clients don't see the fade. They see their their waves sticking out that they hate. They see the cowlick yeah. sticking up that they hate. And so focusing on not just controlling those things, but showing the client how it works to control those things, telling them, look, heat and tension, do this. Don't stop blow drying when it's dry. Stop blow drying when it's not poofy anymore. Like little tips like that. Uh, you said earlier that your smaller tips in your videos recently have been doing so much better on social media. And it's the yeah. same thing with clients. They don't, they don't need to know where their occipital bone is, but they do yeah. need to know, don't stop blow drying when it's dry. Stop blow drying when it's smooth. Like, I mean, that is a light bulb every time I tell a guy that. I'm like, hey, the magic of the hair dryer, if you're just going to blow dry it till it's dry, don't even bother. Just air dry it. If you're if the magic happens, it's going to be two, three minutes after the hair is dry. And every time that's like, literally, oh, I never knew that. That's in my last tip video that I just did. I'm like, yeah, you know, that's you don't I stop when it's dry. Like, telling guys yep. that. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, that's like, that's the kind of stuff. And there was a uh, one time you said, um, Perfect haircuts are boring. I think you said. Um, yeah, good, good haircuts are boring. Good haircuts are boring. Like that kind of stuff. I just get, and and then going into you know that client not coming back. That stuff. That's the stuff that fires me up about this industry. Is that too many people don't get it? They don't get that this industry is way more than just a perfect haircut. The technical aspects. Yeah, there's so much to it. And and the successful people in this industry are doing things so different than the people that are making $25,000 a year and working their asses off because, or sitting, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's because 
you know, there's a lot more to it and, and people just need to realize it's all about relationship and, you know, and, and don't give somebody something you're not going to give them consistently. And that's a good lesson from what you just talked about. Like you can't, don't give them a hot towel treatment one visit and then not have time and don't offer it this visit. Don't give them uh, a, a coffee beverage or whatever it is this time. And then next time forget about it. Cause you're too busy. Like yeah. consistency. I, I, used to take that, I take that down to what I stock my mini fridge with. Like I yeah. buy the same brand of beer and the same water and the same like LaCroix and the same Red Bulls. And I, cause when I change it up, people go, Oh, you don't have that other one. Oh, okay. It's cool. <laughs> Yeah, people I'm afraid love to change that stuff. It. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So let me throw, I got a couple more questions as long as you've got the time. I have all the time in the world. I do what I want. I'm my own boss. I'm unemployed. <laughs> there you go. Um, until, until we have to do something with the kids, right? And then, then we're not yeah. our own boss. That's my real All right. Job. So here's the question. Your best recommendation when cutting calyx in the front of men's hair. So I actually want you to go into... Um, kind of your technique. So we talk about the blow dry a lot and I think people, so if you could give some people some insight in cutting around a cowlick, whether it's in the front or the back, whatever it is and finishing hair with a cowlick, just a couple things on that. Yeah. So the very first thing that I bring up with clients who have an issue with their cowlicks um, and I actually keep some photos on deck to do this, but the trouble with a cowlick is not necessarily the way that it looks. It's that it gets in the client's head that they can't control it. And they think, I want to control every aspect of my hairstyle. And if I can't control this cowlick, then it's wrong. And so right. when you Google Brad Pitt or Google like any of those celebrities, um, I think David Beckham maybe doesn't have any cowlicks, but like Brad Pitt, you cannot find a picture of him without a cowlick going katang. And so I point that out to my clients like, look, just because you can't control it doesn't mean it looks bad. And right. then through the haircut, you know, as long as the shape is right, if like my, I say my theory, like I invented this, but I, I'm in the camp where if, if a haircut is shaped right, it can stick in any direction. It'll still look good. And so when it comes to cowlicks, um, my first approach is to let them do what they naturally do. But that's my own aesthetic is I like hair to look like it's doing things accidentally. Um, if the client absolutely hates the cowlick and they want it to lay down for sure, I keep in mind the very obvious thing that the longer hair is the more willing it is to bend and lay down. Also, when you're texturizing hair, like if you were to take some of those hairs and cut them shorter, the shorter hairs want to stand up. So if a cowlick already wants to stand up and you're like texturizing it and giving it more short hairs that want to stand up, now it's really going to stick out. And so leaving weight around the area is definitely helpful. Uh, and then as far as styling goes, if you flat wrap the hair and that's blow drying it flat to the head in every different direction for 30 seconds each direction over and over and over for like two, three, five minutes, eventually the cowlicks won't stick out anymore. They'll go wherever you put them. And so as far as what works for the client, you need to have an open dialogue and, and start off with, hey, first of all, the cowlick doesn't look bad, so don't worry about it. But if you really hate it, um, you know, we can cut it in a way that it, that it will look better sticking out than, than it did when you walked in. And if you really don't even like that, I'll show you how to make it lay down, but it's going to involve five minutes of your time every morning. Right. That's good. I like that. All right, last... Nope, that's the one we went through. All right, one more. Oh, this is a good one. All right, so cutting edge and color. Any tips on how to be faster at blow drying, especially for clients with very dense hair? Since you're the blow dry uh, finished kind of guy, what do you think about speed in uh, blow drying? Do you have tips for that, or do you think it's better to spend like extra that extra time on that okay so multifaceted answer as usual yep. first um i recently learned that i'm kind of fast at blow drying I, I was in a class with travis parker in uh in san diego and with all these other like professionals around me i was like done blow drying before everyone and i was like oh my gosh i'm really good at this so so i think i might be able to answer this question <laughs> um first of all like don't forget the towel like towel dry the hair as much as you can because that that tons of excess moisture that'll come out so much faster with a towel than it will with a blow dryer and then rough dry everything. Um, if I want more of a natural fall, I won't use a brush while I'm rough drying and I'll just kind of blast it around with high power and high heat. 
um, if I want to control the way it's gonna lay, I'll use a brush and I'll flat wrap it while I'm rough drying. And then once the hair is basically dry, but it's not smooth yet, then I, and I don't know if this is all hair dryers, but with my hair dryer in particular, if I go to high power or uh, high heat and low power, it polishes the hair really, really fast. So I get through a blow dry on short hair in about eight minutes on long hair in like 15 minutes. But um, as far as the nature of the question, how to do it faster, my advice is definitely like when you go to a barber to get a shave, you're not going to do that because you forgot to shave that morning. You're going to do that because it's relaxing and it's a fun experience. Right. And so since I don't shave people, what my relaxing fun experience is, is sitting there while I flat wrap your hair. And it's like a scalp massage. Like I have a, a really nice padded brush that feels amazing against the scalp. And all my regular clients, they like fall asleep while I'm blow drying their hair. And so I never rush that part. If anything, I'll rush a haircut and I won't rush the blow dry because it's a part of the experience and it's relaxing for them. But I also drive the point home when I'm done. I say, do you, do you realize how long I just blow dried your hair? And they're like, yeah, that was like forever. I'm like, yeah, that was eight minutes. Um, keep that in mind. When you style your hair at home and it doesn't look as good as when I did it, it's because I spent eight minutes doing it. It's much like when I shine my shoes, they look okay. But when I take them to a cobbler, they look amazing, right? And the difference right. is I shine my shoes in 10 minutes. The cobbler spends an hour doing it. Um, so as far as blow drying hair faster, take your time, make it a relaxing part of the service. And if your blow dry isn't, if you're, if your blow dry and your style isn't fully polished, you can't know if your haircut is perfect. Like right. you, you'll never, even if I, if I cut curly hair, I blow dry it completely straight to check the cut. And then if they want to wear it curly, I'll wet it again. Yeah. Which is so it's the like way that, that it should be done. Like you have to, you have to yeah. blow dry all the way. Yeah, for sure. I, I, totally 100% agree with you. And I like giving people the tip of the towel dry is, is the best. Like if you can get it as dry as possible with the towel, plus that takes away from the heat damage, I think. And then, then yeah. move into the blow dry and I'll do a, a pretty much like a powered rough dry with my hands, aiming the air down on the hair. I'll do that until it's about 70% dry at that point. And then I start really working with a brush because as long as you're not, you know, tornadoing air around their head, as long as it's a consistent kind of downward motion, you're not going to really have. And if you want to build a little volume, I don't mind like kind of lifting the hair up a little bit in the rough dry, but like getting it that to that point, then going in and doing your smoothing, finishing, polishing work after that, it just saves a lot of time for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. The last, um, hopefully that, that helps them. Um, the last couple of things I want to talk about two things that have nothing to do with hair. And so the people that want to hang on can hang on, but we might as well take this time to talk about cameras for a second because yes. you've went mirrorless. Correct. Have you? No. Yeah. So yeah, mirrorless now. So here's what happened. So I was going, I should have, but right at that moment, I spent way too much on another camera and I got the Canon C200, which is, you know, a cinematic. Well, worth. yeah. Well, so here's the thing I'm, I'm doing video shoots now with, um, some of the hair brands, they come in here and I'm creating content for them, which is again, you know, when we talk about moving your life into where your passion is, my passion is less behind the camera. I mean, I like doing these, these things, but um, less behind the camera, doing the color techniques and more capturing people that are super talented at doing color techniques and putting out that content. So, you know, I partner with a couple brands that come in here. So I wanted to get the bigger camera because it's again, like everything else in life presentation in a way, does that camera do yeah. anything that a mirrorless DSLR or not DSLR, but a mirrorless, you know, camera can do not that I need it to really, but it's the presentation yeah. of it. So, you know, I brought that Absolutely. in, but I should have went oh, mirrorless and I'm excited out. for Canon's new, they're, what they're talking about now. Um, but yeah, let's talk about player. what you use because it's, a, it's an attainable camera for, I mean, it's expensive, but it's no, no more expensive than a really nice, it is more expensive than a Mizutani scissors or whatever it is, you know, but, um, Let's talk about it because it is really important, I think, for people that want to get into content creation. Maybe you're watching this. Um, let's talk about what you're using, and then I'll kind of say what I use as well. So I, I apologize for always giving you long answers. Um, no, it's good. First the of podcast. all, I, I, 
I try to deliberately buy less than the bottom line, less than the top of the line, uh, because I know that most of my followers aren't going to go spend twenty five hundred dollars on a camera. So yeah. the one that I've been using the most lately is a Canon EOS RP. This is a full frame mirrorless camera that retails a thousand dollars right now, which you know that sounds like a lot of money to a lot of people, but having a full frame sensor for a thousand dollars is like ridiculous. Is um, um, yeah. And so I don't want to go too into the, what that full frame means. Go Google it. But uh, but also I use a Canon Rebel SL2 because that is the absolute dirt cheapest camera that I found that can do everything I need to do. It's got a flippy screen. So if I wanted to do a vlog or something, I could do this number and see myself while I'm talking. Um, yeah. The SL2 has focus tracking, which is, you know, the, the camera will follow your face and stay in focus on it. Um, it takes way more than good enough photos for Instagram. And so when when... Barbers and Stylists asks for a first first camera recommendation, Canon SL2, um, and now it's discontinued. So you're gonna find them used for like 300 bucks and it will teach you, it, it'll do everything you need it to do very easily, very quickly, very conveniently. It's got Wi-Fi, it's got a touch screen. It's just like a phenomenal cheap little camera. Yeah, so, um, and then, but here's the thing what people have to understand is that your, when I first started doing YouTube videos, I did start using an iPad. Like I didn't have, I didn't have a super nice camera. I quickly realized though that sound quality, um, when you're creating video content is the, one of the most important things in it because, um, you could have worse looking video, but you need good sound. So if, even if you're using your phone to start creating, if you're doing video content, you can use your phone, even some photo stuff, but you can see the difference between if you really want to get into it, what Andrew is doing on Instagram and his photo work and the lighting lighting is the other thing that we have to talk about, but, yeah. um, it's not just the camera. So he's got the thousand dollar camera, but then that lens that you have on it is not, not cheap. Right. Yeah. So let me, um, something that it irritates me when people go, oh, of course your photos look good. You have an expensive camera. And when any barber or hairstylist tells me that I go, yeah, but your haircuts are only good because you have expensive scissors. You know what <laughs> right. I mean? It's the same yeah. thing. Like if you hand me my phone, I will take a better photo than most people, you know, not, not most people. I, that sounds egotistical, but if you hand me an iPhone, I will take a photo that looks just like my expensive DSLR photos is what I yeah. mean to say. Um, it's when you understand how a camera works and how the lenses affect the way that things look and you understand lighting, you can get any camera to perform. It's just like, if you know, haircutting, you can use a pair of kitchen scissors and give someone a decent haircut, you know? Right. Yep. Going back to what you said about audio, um, Matt, have you seen these road wireless go before? So, so this, did, this device, here, it's the best. I have, it I have it. Yeah. Okay. So you have it. I have it or because, have it? um, yeah, when you're traveling, you just, yeah. Tell them about it. Okay, so what this device is, these two little things here, one of them goes on the camera and plugs into the camera. The other one clips on your shirt or clips wherever you want to put it. And so one is a microphone, one's a receiver, and it's like the size of a watch face. Um, it yep. is so small and convenient. I had $1,500 worth of like pro audio equipment that I kept in a big fancy Pelican case. And you know, I'd run cables all over here to do audio. And now when I do videos, one goes on the camera, one goes on my shirt. And it's just as clean. These things are like 200 bucks and you can plug it into your phone. So like if That's... you want really clean audio with like a phone video, you just one here. And I wanted to use it for this podcast today, but I, my computer inputs are not agreeing with me today. But uh, so, you know, this mic would pick up your voice. And what I've actually been doing with it lately, if you go look at my Instagram, is I'll clip it on a watch band during the haircut. And so while I'm cutting hair, it's picking up the haircut sounds. That's cool. Insider tip yeah. And that's, so I definitely, that's one of the reasons why I got it was to be able to hook it to the phone because I've been using my phone so much more for creating, like capturing video content. Like I, some of these, like there's such great stabilization in your phone now. And like just the wide angles and all that stuff, like it's beautiful, especially if you're outside on a sunny day or like a nice day. Um, and just to be able to clip that, like I can literally clip that clip in my phone case and have the audio hooked in and then hook it to somebody's shirt real quick and do an interview with them or talk to them. So imagine being in the salon, having that clip it on your shirt, put your phone right up. And I just put out this piece of content with, um, 
uh, Jason Everett and his company today, he's posting it, but uh, it was all about creating content behind the chair. And I was saying like, everybody talks about, they don't have time to create content, but if you're busy behind the chair, you're creating content all day. You're just not hitting record and capturing it. Right. So yeah. just imagine like you have this on your, on your lapel. So you don't have to worry about sound quality. You're talking to your client. You have your phone up on a, like a tripod on your station and you're capturing your whole the whole tip you should be given about blow drying and all this stuff that you're talking about, like hit record and then go home at night and just chop it up into little bits. Like I should have done that more when I had a, a large clientele, you know, um, it would have been so it was, it's so much easier because you're already doing it. So like people that say they don't have time, it's just, they just don't want to spend their time doing that. They have the time they're doing it already. So, um, that's I, a, that's I a good one. That. Um, there was a point three or four years ago where I realized if I did a great haircut and took a quick half-assed photo of it, it didn't really do very good on social media. But if I did a decent haircut and I took a great photo of it, it would do better on social media. And so when I realized how important that was, I started at this time, I was working Tuesday to Saturday, full-time book solid. And I started every Thursday night. I told my wife, don't wait up for me, get yourself dinner and do whatever you want. Thursday nights, I'm making content. And it became a thing for for two or three years in my salon, I worked full time. I'd go to I'd go to work, you know, nine to five on a Thursday, and then after work, I would invite a client or a friend or a stranger on Instagram or anybody in for a free haircut. But the exchange was you have to sit and let me take a photo. So yeah. for the last three years or so, ninety five percent of what I post on Instagram was not a regular client during a regular day. It was somebody that came from one of these after hours opportunities. And so I tell people all the damn time, like they go, oh, I don't have time to make content. I'm like, you don't have time to do one extra haircut a week specifically yeah. for better photos. You know, um, it, people, people know that Instagram is a highlight reel and sometimes they'll say it as a negative thing. But if you understand it's a highlight reel, why don't you make time to do your best work to where you don't have a time limit to where you don't have client expectations to where you're not, you know, trying to get any money out of it. But like, if you understand that you need the best content you have, you can have, then set time aside to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And people like, so, and you don't have to like, that's, that's what people need to understand. I just don't understand when people complain and then don't set up aside the time. Like for me, when I started creating content, I was doing it on Wednesday nights, every Wednesday night, we made it a point to it. We were going, so like this was early in my career or like seven years ago. Right. And we, I was training with the, some of the new staff and so we would do a little training and then we'd go sit at the bar. My wife worked at the bar at the time and we would just kind of hang out and talk hair and do whatever. And then it became like, well, why are we doing this? Like, why are we sitting here doing this when we could get a mannequin, film it and do a class, like basically do a, a, a YouTube video every Wednesday night. So that became the goal. And it was just like every Wednesday we'd film the video. I'd edit it that night. And then the next day we'd voice it over. And then it was, you know, a done deal. And that's kind of, that consistency of doing it every Wednesday, it took a while, but then all of a sudden you start to get that traction of people, the community starting to build, you know? And, yeah. and it went from, I was, I worked for Paul Mitchell for 10 years and I've said this story a lot, but people that are new to this, like I worked for Paul Mitchell for 10 years. I drove six hours every weekend in my car. Most of the time, like I would drive to Northern New York. Like I, I was everywhere in my car to teach four people like every week I was doing 75 classes a year and, and you're spending all that time away from your house and all this stuff. And then when I made my first YouTube video, I remember it got a hundred views in the first week. And I was like, this is it. You know, yeah. like a hundred views, like a hundred people watched. And then it was a thousand, you know, a couple weeks later and I'm like, wow. And then, so then you get the, it starts to feed you, but like, I had a passion for it. I had a passion for figuring out the cameras. Like even today we had audio issues syncing this up. It's my favorite thing to now, when we get off this podcast, figure out why that audio isn't working. Like I can't wait. I'm already yeah. in my mind. Like I can't wait to fix this issue, but like, that's my passion. That's why I do it. I don't think people should do it. If they're not passionate about it, you're going to be miserable. Um, it's a yeah, lot of work. Exactly. It's like and I said earlier, if you do it and you do it well, you're going to have to do more of it. So make yeah. sure you like doing it. You know, um, <laughs> right. I, I, I want to build off of what you're saying there. Like 
people will ask me, well, how do you find time to make these videos? And honestly, from my perspective, I don't know how I would live if I wasn't doing it. Like I would go freaking crazy. Like I will, I'll sit on the couch with an idea and I know like my wife needs me to help with the baby for a minute or whatever. And I'm like, Hey, at four o'clock can I run down to the office and do a video? Like I itch to go do it. And yeah. to me, like when, when people go, well, okay, I guess I have to do these videos. How do I, how do I get the time to do it? I'm like, if you're not itching to go do it, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, don't you know do what I mean? It. Like, I, I obsess over making content because it's fun for me. It's so fun for me to buy a new lens and see how it looks and set up lights. And, and if, if it's not fun for you to do it, then don't do it. I mean, there are people out there too. Um, uh, Dilla Hodge. Um, oh my gosh. What's his name? I, I can't remember his Instagram name. Um, Justin Dillahay. Dillahay. That's right. Um, this dude, he's got over a hundred thousand followers. He shoots everything with his iPhone. Um, Jacob Kahn, like he's yeah. everything he shoots is an iPhone and he's killing the game. And so like, to, I imagine to a guy like Jacob, if I said, here's a cool DSLR, he would just go, eh, you know, he doesn't need it. It's um, another step. So yeah, it's another step. And if you can get there without that step, cool. But to me, the step is so much fun. Like I have more yeah. fun playing with cameras than I have playing with hair. And, uh, yeah. I, so I think that's a huge key factor too. Like, and I learned that through these Thursday nights and, and another tip about Thursday nights or for you, it was Wednesday nights. When I was working in the salon full time, a client would come in and I go, okay, what do you want to do with your hair? Right. And then I'd have a half hour to cut their hair and send them on their way. But on Thursday nights, when the model would come in, instead of putting the cape on them and saying, what do you want to do with your hair? I would hand them a beer and I'd sit down next to them. Cause I don't have a time limit cause it's Thursday night. And I'd be like, okay, cool. So, and we would talk about their hair as as the photo shoot that it was about to be. And we would go, okay, what do we want to say with this hair? And, and we would have a much different dialogue with the haircut. What is the yeah. vibe we want to go for? And we'd look for inspiration photos for like, because I if you if you look through the internet, you'll find that most of my photos are ripped off of like James Dean photos and Elvis photos. Like I look for old photos and rip them off. And so we would go through this whole pro different process and take our time when I was cutting these models. But when I had a client, it was put the cape on and what do you want to do with your hair? And eventually one of my models who was normally a regular client, he goes, dude, it was so much more fun to get my hair cut after hours. Like, can we do yeah. it this way every time? I'll pay you a hundred bucks. And then I went, I'm, I was giving these models a hundred dollars worth of haircut where I was giving my clients $40 worth of haircut. And yeah. I started to loathe being on the schedule and doing, you know, half hour haircuts and put on the cape and go, okay, what do you want? And I wanted every haircut to be sit down. Here's a drink. What do you want your hair to say about you? And it was a completely different experience. And today, every client that I take, it's that model experience is, is what I eventually shifted my entire business to is I, I started taking models one day a week and it was my favorite haircut of the week. And the, the model loved their getting their haircut way more than my clients love getting their haircuts. And that yeah. was what transitioned from doing $40 haircuts to doing $100 haircuts was how I talk to them, how I treat them, how much time I take on their hair. Like I never, ever let them smell that I'm rushing if I even am, which I don't rush because, because people are paying me too much to rush, you know? Um, but I learned the difference between a $40 haircut and a hundred dollar haircut by doing free haircuts after hours and getting offered a hundred dollars to do more of those. Yeah. That's it. People don't realize the power of free, of doing things for free. Like I never, I never set out to make videos to make money from it, everything evolved into me now doing a job that I literally love. Like I, I, I get to do whatever I want, like, but just create all the time. And, but that's yeah. what I love to do. That's not necessarily what everybody does. So, um, I think that's what people need to think about more is when, when they go into figuring out what it is that they love and they have a passion for, if it's working behind the chair and you love your guests, like, um, I actually, one of the stylists here, Brian, he's, uh, he started this whole uh, hashtag thing and he started a, a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, and he's, he's working on getting it like to go, but it's the, it's hashtag. Why are you in my chair? And he takes a picture with every single one of his clients and he tells the story of how they ended up in the chair and, and, you know, or how long yeah. he's been doing their hair and all that stuff. And it's kind of like a blog, right? But he loves, like, I've never seen somebody love just being behind the chair as much as him. And that's yeah. a, that's a, like, I, I get jealous of that. Cause I don't have, there's another guy, Tom Harris. That I worked with in Paul Mitchell for a long time. I've never seen, he's, he's 
I'm not sure how old he is and I don't want to out him on how old he is anyways, but he's an older guy. Um, big mentor of mine for, for a long time because he is obsessed with being behind the chair and he has been for years and years. Right. And I'm just not that that's not my passion. I love teaching and creating and doing all that stuff, but that's, I, I just hope that people figure out, um, you know, that there is a way you, it's just not always the traditional way, like going about it as a free thing, making it a hobby, doing it for free, building up something. And then eventually it might turn into something, or if it doesn't, you still love doing it. So it doesn't matter. Um, and that's cool. And I, I'm so glad that you've figured that out. Um, and I can tell, like, I can tell by the things that you're saying that, you know, you're living that life too. Like you're excited. You just get to kind of do your thing and create, um, I'm gonna, is there anything else you want to talk about? Anything else you want to get out there? I do want to ask you how this, so I've noticed you've shifted your diet. So I've, I follow your like personal Instagram. So yeah, I'm a steak. So when I traveled the last two years, I, uh, my one thing was, I, and I'm not like a people person really, um, <laughs> like in one-on-one -on -one in a weird, you know, uncomfortable way, but like, so I would travel to a hair show and I wouldn't really hang out with anybody there. And I was by myself. So I would go in every city and try to find the best steak that I could. So I would research it. And then I would, that would be like my excitement. And I get a ribeye in every, every city that I went to. And I've noticed that you're eating them for breakfast. So let's talk about this. Cause you've made a health shift and there's hairdressers out there that, you know, maybe they're, trying to figure things out, but I'm interested in this. I want to know you're eating steak and eggs for okay. breakfast. So, Tell me two about disclaimers this. here before I talk about this. Um, three disclaimers. First, I've never talked about this publicly yet, so I, I don't know if I'll be very polished with some of my answers here. Okay. Um, second disclaimer is, is I am in no way a dietitian or a nutritionist. Like I'm not telling anybody to go eat what I eat. Um, yes. This is not advice for you. This is just a story about what I'm doing. And then yes. the third thing is I do apologize to any vegans. I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't, so, I have a lot of vegan friends and families, but basically for the last three months now, almost three and a half months, I've eaten nothing but steak and eggs. Um, and I've had a little bit of salmon off and on here and there, but I started the diet because, well, like I was pretty much eating almost mostly keto, like a lot of steak and asparagus and sweet potatoes, sometimes a little bit of sweet potato. Like I was eating pretty clean anyways, but I was, you know, 30 pounds overweight and tired all the time and just drinking tons of caffeine like I'm still doing now. And, uh, but I also, I had some pretty bad depression and really bad anxiety, thanks to the caffeine probably. And I, I heard about this carnivore diet um, from Jordan Peterson. And he said he was eating steak, salt and water for every meal and that his depression went away. And so I was just like, kind of fed up with dealing with not wanting to get out of bed some days. And, and I was like, you know what, like eating steak for every meal might kill me. I might have a heart attack, but if I continue with depression, that might kill me too. So screw it. And so I just started eating literally every meal. I would eat steak, salt, and water for two weeks. And okay. at the end of the two weeks, my depression was gone. At the end of the two weeks, my anxiety was completely gone. Like for, for two or three years, I constantly felt like I was running late. You know that feeling when you're like, oh, we, yeah. we got to get there. We're running late. I felt that nonstop for three years. And, you know, imagine trying to go to bed when you feel like you're running late for something. So I wasn't sleeping good or anything. But after to two be weeks honest, of nothing but steak and water. So I, when I talked to you last week, because we were supposed to do this podcast last week, and that's the feeling I was having is that whole, and yeah. I don't really get that feeling that often, but for some reason, last week hit me and it was like, I don't know if you're just doing too much or what too much running around, whatever it was. And I, I have a cardiologist yeah, cause I'm, I, I'm like up at like, there's no way on my, on my life I could have a steak all the time because I, it, my family's full of heart problems, but I have, uh, oh, but I was into that discussion. Yeah. Do you have the same thing? Well, so, um, let me con continue with, yeah, with yeah, the go. benefits after I start. Right, so, uh, in the, in the first two weeks, I lost like 15 pounds and I felt amazing. My energy like was just constantly here and my mood was constantly here. Like there was no ups and downs throughout my day. I felt amazing. And I, and I, then I started thinking after two weeks of everything felt so good. I was like, okay, well, let's find out what this is actually doing to me. I started doing research like about cholesterol and, and all this other stuff. And 
mo like there's a whole bunch of recent findings that first of all, your, your body produces its own cholesterol. I, I think I read something like six eggs worth of cholesterol a day is like created from within your body. And so you, even if you don't eat any cholesterol, your body makes it. Um, but what they're finding now is if you're eating carbohydrates, your body will absorb and hang on to fat, um, in, including cholesterol. And so they found on absolutely zero carb diets that the cholesterol goes in, is used as it's needed to be used, and it goes out. And so I haven't had my blood work done yet, but I have a friend on this diet who just got his blood work done, and his cholesterol has actually gone down since since eating nothing but steak and eggs. And okay. uh, so it's it's like the the latest findings and stuff. And and you know it, it offends people because we've been told for a hundred years that like oh no 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 steak's bad for you, but they're they're finding now that. It's like, and, and this is something I definitely found. Um, as I said, I used to eat like steak and asparagus for every meal. By cutting out the asparagus, I feel better. By cutting out the asparagus, I lost weight. And I've learned that there's a massive difference between eating a lot of meat and eating only meat in the way that you okay. feel and the way that you operate. My energy was never like if, if when I was eating steak and a half a potato, I would like feel, you know, really satisfied after I ate, but then quickly just plummet my mood and energy. And now if I eat uh, two steaks and no potato, I just stay up here. There's no crash afterward. And um, same thing with like the effects on your blood. And it's like, if you're just eating the steak, pardon me, the, your body doesn't hang on to the cholesterol. But if you're eating a steak and potato, now your body goes, okay, burn the potato, save the fat. And so, right. I mean, that's the basis of like a ketogenic diet. And it's, of, of course, it's controversial and there'll be naysayers and go, well, that's a, that study was funded by the state council or I don't know. Like, um, so <laughs> you, it's all internet stuff. Believe what you want to believe. But I've yeah. known people who have lowered their cholesterol by eating steak and eggs. Oh, I'm praying and that that's a thing. <laughs> it's, I'm, 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 I'll get my blood work done like ASAP. Like I'm due for a just typical physical, but like. Uh, I, well, I'm getting my blood work done next week on my current situation. So then maybe I'll do it and then I'll get blood work done a couple months later and see what happens. I, I think you should we'll report back. Well, the other thing too is like, I've been eating nothing but steak for three months. And like, I doubt, you know, I'm going to go to the doctor in 10 years and they're going to go, Ooh, something doesn't look good. Did you eat steak for three months, 10 years ago? Like, you know what right. I mean? It's not going to do any irreversible harm or anything. Yeah. But, uh, and I'm, I'm even going off the deep end as far as like some conspiracy theory stuff. Like I, I try not to get too sucked into this, but when you start reading about like vegetables are made of cellulose, we cannot digest cellulose. When a cow eats cellulose, he turns it into protein. He's got four stomachs to do so. We don't have four stomachs. When you eat a piece of asparagus, your body will use like 2% of it and the rest of it comes out. And we go, oh, that's the food we're made to eat. Are we made to eat it? Is it, you know, when you eat a steak, people say, oh, don't eat steak. You're not going to be able to shit. And it's like, sorry, pardon my French. Um, <laughs> I, don't eat steak. You won't be able to go to the bathroom. And for years, I was told that it blocks you up and it sits in you and it rots. And like, this was by my vegan sister. Like, oh, steak just sits in you and rots. You know what steak actually does? Is it 95% comp- it, of the steak breaks down and is used by your body. 5% of it comes out. That's why nothing comes out. But you eat asparagus and almost all of it comes out. You eat broccoli and almost all of it comes out. You eat corn and it comes out whole. And, and then you, you try to tell me, oh, we're making this stuff that you can't digest, but you're not right. supposed to eat this stuff that your body completely breaks down and uses. The other thing, too, is with the, with the high fat diet like this, the, um, all the fat in the steak, it signals your brain like that. You know that feeling like, like, oh, that was a good meal, that like just satisfied feeling. It triggers that and you just feel so freaking good. And then it lasts for like eight hours. You feel that way. And I mean... I, I feel physiologically, I, when I eat steak, I feel like, oh my gosh, that's what I'm supposed to eat. Like, I just feel right. And I've never felt this way in my life. I've never felt this good. But again, I've never spoken about it publicly because it offends people. Like people are watching this right now, rolling their eyes going, oh, you're going to kill yourself. And, and um, don't you, didn't you see game changers? Don't you know that plants are better for you? <laughs> I saw it and I saw all the videos debunking it. <laughs> I, um, I was watching the chat. I'm trying to, and li- there's nobody... Nobody being negative yet. So it's good. So we're oh. good. Good explanation. Like, but Ryan Teal, like Ryan Teal wants to know what cut of steak and how many ounces per day are you eating? Okay. So typically like, okay, I, I find that if I get cheaper cuts and steaks that aren't as good, it's harder to stick to the diet because it's not as fun to eat like a breakfast steak, you know? 
And so when I can, I try to stick with ribeye um, cause it's delicious. And, yeah. uh, and so like, I would say half my steaks are ribeyes, but then to save on cost a little bit, I get Porterhouse or New York. Um, and that's like a happy medium. But then if I really am trying to save a buck, cause I mean, I'll spend 50, 60 bucks a day at the grocery store on steaks sometimes. Yeah, so that's if the I'm trying to save money, I'll get tri-tip because tri-tips like dirt cheap and it's pretty good. Um, so that's usually what I stick to. If I'm being lazy and I want to get fast food, I'll go to In-N-Out and, uh, and get like eight meat patties just straight up. But, uh, I, I definitely have found that if I eat lower quality steaks, I, I don't feel as satisfied and don't stay as full as long. Cause it, typically they're like leaner cuts too. But if I eat like a good fatty ribeye, like I just feel good for, for days. And, and that's the other weird thing. Everything is like, you're saying is heaven right now it, to me. It's, it's regulated my appetite in a way that I can't even believe, but like, so basically since I've been doing this, I haven't felt hungry. I haven't had that like empty stomach feeling where I'm like, Oh, I need food. Even if I don't eat for 12 hours, I don't get that feeling anymore. What I get is I'll get a little headache or I'll get a little cranky and then I know it's time for food. Um, But some days I'll wake up and 7 a.m. I'll have like a ribeye and then I don't think about food again. It's not even a thought in my head until eight o'clock that night. And so when I've been traveling, like I went to Austin a few weeks ago, I woke up, had a steak at 6 a.m. And then I'm then I flew over to Austin, which is like two hours ahead and like 7 p.m. Austin time. I was like. Oh, I could go for a steak again, but the entire day going through the airport with, with an, uh, a nine month old baby or 10 month old baby at the time, like I didn't think about food. And I was like, oh my gosh, life is easy when you don't think about food. Normally I'm in the <laughs> airport, like, oh, I gotta go eat a crappy sandwich and get a, get a bag of Skittles to hold me over. Like on this diet, I don't get hungry. Uh, I, yeah. I eat like a snake I eat once or twice a day and then I'm just good. Okay. And well, that's like good. at I- times. Just to see what I could do, I packed out, I packed down like, you know, 50 ounces of steak before just to see if I could. And at the end, I don't feel like, oh, I'm so stuffed. Like, I just feel satisfied and I don't get that stuffed feeling and I don't yeah. get that hungry feeling. It almost feels like there's like a disconnected connection where I, I don't feel hungry anymore. It's insane. Well, but what I had read is because of the high fat content is like, it tells your body like, no, you don't need any more. You're satisfied. Okay. Well, I'm going to look salad. into it because... I, I, and I, I can't wait to have that conversation with the cardiologist and be like, Hey, what do you think? <laughs> but I, I agree doctor, with you that it's, uh, you know, the whole cholesterol thing is, it makes sense. So, all right. Is there anything else we need to talk about? Um, any questions you have anything you feel good? No. When can we do it again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. I, I think we should. I'm like, I'm making like this whole, I'm consistently doing the podcast again because I felt I took some time off of it in a way and I was cutting up old podcasts, trying to, to create subjects out of them. But what I found with old content, which is something that like I was reposting old content a lot, but I just, the thoughts that I had five years ago, I don't have them anymore. Like I'm the the older I'm getting the, like I used to get really like frustrated if somebody was negative towards something I did online or like, a lot of this stuff happened. And then, and now like, I'm, you know, I'm pushing, I'm going to be 37 in uh, March, but, um, I just feel like I listen to old podcasts. I'm like, I don't even think like that. Like I wasn't thinking like myself. I wasn't being me. I wasn't like having my own real thoughts. I was taking so much like from other people, listening to other people and creating my opinions that way that now I just feel like, I want to redo everything, you know, and that's why I'm yeah. really enjoying this podcast now and like trying to, to do it a little bit different where I have people like you that I look up to and what you do and what you create and like just have conversation instead of an interview or, you know, like talk about just hair. Like it's not about like this industry is about so much life is about so much more. And it's just fun to have these conversations and talk about these things and, and to talk to people that, you know, create these kind of inspirations for me. So I appreciate, um, you know, everything you do, you've always been very supportive of free salon education and you know what I've been doing. Like I had a guy fly from California, um, when I had a class here once and he said it was because you said that he should come try it out. And that was just kind of crazy. Cause we're in the middle of nowhere on the other side of the country. And like, you know, you sent him here. So it's just, you know, it's cool to have that kind of community and, 
uh, people need to realize that there's enough room for all of us to create yeah. and showcase our passions. And if everybody would just showcase their passion and not try to be something that they're not, then I think this industry is going to be even better. So um, I think, uh, thanks for like pushing that. And I actually, um, another thing um, that I want to talk to you about really off of this podcast, but I have you on the phone. Um, I'm creating this website that has a lot of client-based stuff and I've been creating, that's kind of why the blow dry tutorials are coming out because they're focused for both hairdressers and uh, um, clients, but it's going to be a connection point and it should be launching. We're working on the app now, but it should be launching in a couple months. I'm really excited to showcase that to everybody, but um, it, it could be a fun project for me and you to work, you know, to I'll, help I'll with, here. you know, some content and stuff. I, I'm, looking for, I'm looking for an excuse to one day fly out to you. Like I've, I've been so envious of your creative space. Like I, I need to be there one day. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fun. It's funny. Cause anybody that comes here, like it is, it's connected to my salon, but it's completely separate. And it's just like this, you know, room of just technology. So I, I would love to have you out here. We'll have to figure out, um, uh, you know, we both have, small kids. So it's uh, my kids yeah. aren't that small anymore, but, um, you're, you're living the, uh, the, hu the hustle life of a child now at this point, right? Yeah. She just started walking like yesterday yeah. basically. And so it's so much less like sitting around and chilling now. It's like constantly running after her and like, don't touch that and don't break that. Yeah. Uh, it's fun. Well, we got to figure out, I mean, it's not that hard to, it wouldn't be that hard. So we, we should figure it out. Cause it would be a really fun collaboration. Like the two of us and just create for a day. Um, for sure. I just so maybe, yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's see. So let's, fi let's figure that out. And we'll definitely do another podcast again for sure. Cause, uh, this is fun. People seem to like it. Um, and thank you to everyone that was online listening, yes, watching. Um, I actually, I'm going to pick somebody to win something real quick. Let's see. Who are we gonna pick? I'm just gonna scroll through, pick a name, and that's I pick a name that I can read. And I'm gonna say Mary Elizabeth, who was on YouTube. So Mary, if you email me, Matt at freesaloneducation.com, I'll send you something. It'll probably be something from our shop. So um just email Matt at freesaloneducation.com post that you were the winner and I need your address, your, your phone number. And that should be good. All right. So if I go make an address, that's Mary something. And I email you, I can get free stuff. <laughs> Don't give away the secret. <laughs> that's good. All right, guys. Cool. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much. Follow Andrew. He's got 14 Instagrams. So you can go to Andrew does hair is the first one. Uh, ADH brand is your product, oh, yeah, right? So, um, yeah, so go follow him, follow everything he's doing. If you're not already, I'm sure you are. What's that? ADH book. ADH oh, book. ADH book. Yeah. That. That's a good one I, too. I on Instagram. Yeah. And that book, that was, that was a cool move. Has it been growing? Is it still growing? No, like the numbers on it aren't really going up, but I also don't promote it really. Um, it's right. more of yeah. like, I just wanted to have, free resource available to anybody who wanted it. Um, they, I, I, somebody once told me like, Oh, you should write a book. You have so much information. And so I was like, okay, I think I will. I started writing a book. And during the time that I was writing it, I was looking for a way to publish it. And as a way to kind of tease that, Hey, I'm writing a book. I would post pages of it on Instagram and then a light bulb turned on. I was like, dude, I could put the entire thing to Instagram. And as far as I know, nobody else has done that. I think I invented that concept. So if you go to ADH book and you put it on like list view, you can just scroll down through the pages and read the book. Um, but yeah, it's just stories about my career and pivotal moments when, as I pretty much changed my perception on what I do. And, and, and essentially, like during the, the time that the book was written, like the stories, uh, when I started, I was charging 20 bucks for a haircut. When I finished, I was charging 60 bucks for a haircut in the same chair. And so essentially, it was pivotal moments that led to raising my prices and, and working on more of the clients I wanted to work on. Sorry for the okay. long story. This thing is just going to keep going and going. No, it's good. Somebody said ADH brand. I said that one, right? Yes. Yeah. 
I forget okay. about that. See, I have such a hard time like hawking my product and being like, hey, go go to here. Like, but yes, that, that's an important one. Let me do that for uh, you. That account, I'm good at that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that account's actually run by my wife. Um, okay. But it's, but you know, she's she's in. She knows. She knows what's up. Like, if you have any questions or anything about the product, she's got it. So we, I, I just put that disclaimer out there because people will message that account thinking they're getting me. Oh, good call. Ryan Teal said it's a great book. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan's a great guy. All right, cool. All right, Andrew. I'll talk to you soon, all right? All right, man. Thank you very much. Do I have to like hit close or anything or are you going to do that for me? I'm going to shut you off. You can hit okay. close too. See ya. Okay, I'm just going to. There we go. All right. And there's two of me. Okay. So, all right, guys. Um, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast, being on here live. Again, this podcast is brought to you by my friends at MinervaBeauty.com. Go to MinervaBeauty.com backslash FSE. Um, all of you guys that hung in there through that whole conversation with the, <laughs> the steak talk, the camera talk, the hair talk, all of it. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, anywhere on this video, check the comments. Let me know what you think of the show. You like it? What would you like to see different? Um, I'm up for criticism. Uh, you know, just be nice. But hope you guys have an awesome day. Enjoy your day. And I'll see you guys on next week. Actually, Monday, I believe I'm having on the guy that did... What's her name? It's a special guest. Monday. <laughs> be ready for it. All right, guys. Thank you for listening, watching, whatever you're doing. I'll see you on the next show. Thanks, Ryan Teal, for being a part of the show. I'll see you guys.